to the said that in the first session, all of Professor Satish Thavan's contributions to space have been covered, and we are now going to look at the other contributions. What I'd like to suggest uh, was really and that was the Indian Institute of Science, where he stayed as a faculty member from 1951 uh, till 1981. And of the three decades that he spent officially, for 18 of those years, he was also the director of the institute. So in contributions to the transformation of the Indian Institute of Science, I think the right person would have been Professor Narasimha. But what he did was he called me and said, would I talk about it? So I hear a quote from Professor Narsama, who says that when I came here as a student in 1953, a common joke about the labs was that it around. While some people worked extremely hard, there were quite a large number of others who took it easy. I knew faculty members who would be tennis at three o'clock and then take their tea and go home. All of that stopped after Dhawan to go. When I arrived in 1973, Professor Dhawan had already been the director of 25. He was 53, I was a lecturer, and he had been the long-serving director. So we were separated to a great extent by, uh, by positions in the academic hierarchy and also by the kind of disciplines in which we were interested. But the Indian Institute, Institute it was almost 50 years before Professor Dhawan took over. He took over shortly after the Golden Jubilee of the Institution. There were major reforms that he carried out. The first was democratization, which meant that the heads of department transformed into chairs and they rotated. Part, uh, right, which tells you that before Professor Dhawan, I believe that the institute's heads of department were really Germanic. They were head professors, and they were people who the departments were completely under their control. So the institution was a collection of departments. He did many things, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The induction of stars and the creation of the department. The other thing that he did, which I will not touch upon, but which was transformational, was the introduction of the formal course program for PhD students. I have a little cartoon by the side. How do professors, how would they like to spend their time? Generally, professors in academic institutions will say, don't tell me what to do. So those wonderfully structured organization, which is possible in the Indian Space Research Organization, is certainly not possible in an academic institution like the Indian Institute. In the year, to serve when the Institute was celebrating its centenary. So I did correspond, I corresponded with an American educationist who had visited in the spring of 1966 to meet uh, to the Institute. His PhD thesis at that time dealt with the setting up of the Indian Institutes of Technology, the IITs. But he felt that there was very little to write about the Indian Institutes of Technology, so he came to the Indian Institute of Science. And then he found that there was a great deal to write about, and eventually his thesis dealt with the role of the Tata shaping higher education in modern India. He says, my first visit was probably spring 1966, when I met Dr. Satish Thawan. And what Professor Thawan asked him at that time was why the mission or goal of the Institute included both arts and sciences, but they were no longer there. And both arts and science were a part of what the Institute was meant to be. Undoubtedly, I was thinking about the transformation of the Institute. What was the original mission of the Institute and how had that mission changed for, for historical reasons over the years? But Kim, so a long time ago, said that it was due to the visit in 65 or 66. 
for research on the establishment of the IITs, I covered what I regard as the source of the social and intellectual capital that led to their establishment after independence, the Indian Institute of Science and Law. However important foreign technical assistance is from the IITs, I thought and still think the story could be more accurate to go through a better understanding of the struggle to establish the institute. When I read this, here was an American commentator now talking about institutions in the setting up of other institutions in India. P.K. Kelka went from the institute to Bombay and then later he went to IIT Bombay and then IIT Kanti Ghosh went to the first director of the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. So Dhawan really sat in the chair at the Indian Institute of Science which in many ways was a very important institution for the kind of people that it produced. But especially leaders, they always stand on the shoulders of their predecessors. And of the many directors who proceeded in power, I would just like to single out four. The first two, who Morris Travers built the main building and also the director's bungalow in which Dhawan spent 18 years. It is at the institute that Tavan met his wife, and the institute was his family. Martin Foster, who brought some institute and expanded chemical research in the institute. Then, of course, there were the turbulent years of Raman. But Raman brought one important thing to the Indian Institute of Science, and that was the absolutely central role of research. And then Nyan Chandra Ghosh who served at a very critical time after Raman had been removed as a director all the way till independence and beyond. J.C. Ghosh, I believe, was one of the most important transformational directors of the Institute until Satish Thawan. There were only four departments, chemistry, electrical technology, biochemistry, and physics when Raman came in 1934. And 56, a number of departments were created, and you can see how these would have been created by the needs of the war and by the needs of an India which was going to become independent or had just become newly independent and was industrialized. The architect of the transformation after this was, and I believe he transformed. This was a picture which I have taken just before he. Uh, before he became the director, and another picture shortly before he left office of the director. Chaos was I quote him again. He says here, even as late as 1968, which is when he came, he said it's hard to imagine that such a preeminent place did not cover subjects as mathematics, theoretical physics, ecology, atmospheric science, etc., etc., molecular biology. And it did not, in short, cover almost anything modern. It had only old work, nor did it own a decent computer. A few IISC researchers went to TIFR in Mumbai for their computational work. This is K.R. Srinivasan, one of the most distinguished uh, alumni of the Post-1960, one of the early things that Dhawan did was to set up the Central Institute of Services Laboratory, which today is the Implementation and applied physics. But what he did was he recognized the importance of instrumentation when found scarce. Chemical spectroscopy, glass blowing, vacuum technology all grew of out of what we called the CISL. This was long before the Department of Science and Technology came into existence and began to set up sophisticated instrumentation centers all over India. In the late 1960s, with Russian collaboration, he set up the School of Automation. And the School of Automation eventually transformed. In 1970, he set up the Computer Center. It was there when I came, and it eventually morphed into the Supercomputer Education and Research Center with some powerful computers in India. What Tavan did was to bring people. He brought from Madras. It was a sign of the times that Madras University 
was no longer able to hold some of its most distinguished faculty members. And so when Ramachandran fled from Madras, the Indian Institute of Science, oh, he had been a student here. He had been a student of Raman here. He is and will remain one of the scientists in post-independence India. Ramachandran set up the Molecular Biophysics Unit in which I was recruited in 1973. In 1976, he brought to the Institute Chenar Rao. And by that time, Kanpur was already in the throw. I had kinds of political troubles when people were looking for places to go. The Indian Institute of Science provided a stable environment and a very supportive director in Satish Thawar. Two departments, the Solid State and Structural Chemistry and Material Research Center, units which have done remarkably well in the decades that followed, were set up in Bhavan style. And then he brought one distinguished Indian physicist then in America to set up the Center for Theoretical Studies in 1972. But what did Sudarshan do? In the Center for Theoretical Studies, which was in the old building of the Institute Jankana, he assembled a galaxy of people. He brought Professor Mukunda, Professor Mukunda, who's been so central to many of the activities of the academy. Who began ecology in India. Sulochana Gadgal came. She began atmospheric sciences. Sharat Chandra, who later established such wonderful laboratories for genetics, Vidyanand Anjundaya, who brought evolutionary biology to the Institute. All these people were brought to the Center for Theoretical Studies, which Tavan set up and encouraged. It turns out that today they have changed their names. We now have a major Center for Ecological Sciences, a Center for Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and a Center for High Energy Physics. High Energy Physics came to this campus really with Professor Mukunda, Professor Raja Raman, and Professor Pashupati. They were the people who brought theoretical physics until some years later, Professor T.V. Ramakrishnan and others joined the Indian Institute of Science. Until then, Raman was a metal physics department. Other interests, and I think some of these will be touched on, I'm sure, by Jyotsna when she talks. Here is a picture which I've picked up from her article, which is a mathematics magazine, Bhavna. She shows this picture, and this picture has some of the people at the Institute who were interested in other things. Professor A.R. Vasudev Murthy, Professor A.K.N. Reddy, who were interested in the social applications of science, in the applications of science for the uplift of other people. A.K. Reddy, with the help of Satish Tavan, set up the application of science and technology for rural areas, ASTRA, in 1974, which is now the Center for Sustainable Technology. And Mr. Mr. Setarao, who's there in the background, the Karnataka State Council for Science and Technology in 1975. The Karnataka State Council of Science and Technology is something which has really organically tied the Institute to its environment. Today, many of the interactions of the Institute with societally important projects in Karnataka go to the Karnataka State Council of Science and Technology. And this State Council of Science and Technology, which is chaired by the director of the Indian Institute of Science, is still a model for other State Councils of Science and Technology. What facet of Satish Thavan does this indicate? It indicates the fact that he was deeply concerned about the applications of science, the problems around the Indian Institute of Science, which are so visible in society. In fact, some of it translated into actions at the Indian Space Research Organization. Dhawan's outlook on life, I believe, was largely influenced by the decades that he spent at the Indian Institute of Science. It is that outlook that he brought to building the Indian Space Research Organization. His discomfort, which has been mentioned here about the weaponization of space, really comes from the fact that he was sometimes troubled by the applications of technology for destructive purposes. 
And I think he did his best to widen the horizon of the Institute. On the one hand, to bring in people who talk about sophisticated disciplines of science. On the other hand, to encourage and support people who talked about the applications of science in other areas. Assess Satish Thakur 100 years that he was born, and nearly 20 years after he has left us. In the archives at the Raman Research Institute, there is this handwritten note. It was written by Satish Thakur when Professor C. D. Raman, the president, was on the 21st of November 1970. And what did Thakur write? certain that this handwritten by him, but I think Jotsna would be a better judge to decide whether this was actually written by him at that time, and probably was, but I'm not sure. What was written here tells me something. Dr. Kasturi Rangan at the beginning said that Tavan had a degree in English literature. His language was always wonderful. And here he says that for reasons quite obscure, a rare phenomenon occurs when a unique individual endowed with extraordinary gifts of intellect, courage, and perception of beauty appears and for a little while a radiance illuminates the path of lesser men. And he said that Professor Raman was one such outstanding torchbearer of the science. I have said it more eloquently, but what would I say? I would say that Satish Dhawan was one such outstanding, such outstanding leader for the development of science and technology in modern India. He espoused causes which today one would consider as left of center causes. But I think this does not take away really from how much of a contribution he has made to the growth of Indian science and technology. What would be a final question for Professor Dhaba? I believe, since he liked English literature, thought I must. Professor Dhaba was a man for all seasons. It was used to describe, to describe Thomas More, whom Henry And as early as 1520, a commentator wrote that an angel's wit learning. I'm his fellow. For where is the man of that gentleness, lowliness, and affability? And as time required, a man of marvelous mirth and prospects, sometimes a sad little, a man for all seasons. I believe that this encapsulates many of the qualities that many of us have witnessed personally in Professor Satish Thakur. And it is really a great privilege for me to have been able to talk at an event which marks the centenary of his birth. Thank you very much.